anybody watch any of the last lectures? I'm going to keep on asking because you're going to, at some point, you're going to want to listen to it again because it's affecting you personally. It might help you personally and you need to like digest it a little slower. Um, partly because I sometimes think things and don't say it. And then I know I ramble and take, I, I understand kind of my limitations in the future. And you might maybe catch more if you listen to it a little slower. If this apply, if this is something you, you really need to work on. Um, plus they're on YouTube, which means you can kind of watch them forever, whenever, or recommend them if you think that you know someone that might need to hear this information. So last week we were, we transitioned from kind of survival mode into how that third hierarchy of need, our kind of survival, really evolutionary survival need to want to feel worthy of inclusion. It's such a huge aspect of our psyche and our well-being. So, and of course, the majority of our society or a large, the major issues that people struggle with when it comes to anxiety, um, stress and depression isn't necessarily, um, where am I gonna get my food? That is prominent, it does happen. There's a reason why we have a food pantry. There's a reason why there's nutrition, there's programs built into this um, country, right? And part of it is if you don't have access to food, you're gonna have some illness mentally. You're going to not be able to function at a higher level. You're, you're not going to be able to, for example, in this class or any other class, if you're struggling to get access to food, you're going to struggle to even understand uh, cognitively or function cognitively at a higher level to really understand what I'm talking about. Um, okay, great. Okay. So... When you kind of have access to food, water, shelter, you're, you're at least we have those things. You could say the majority of people here, for, it's probably a social, it's a sense of worth, sense of purpose, sense of where you belong. What do you have to give? Do you have something worthy of being included and, and loved by? And there's a lot of research um, looking at social structures. In fact, what, what I'm seeking, what I'm looking to do for my PhD dissertation is looking at how countries are set up that might be impacting population mental health. Why is it that the United States in particular, and we kind of finished with this last week, has a mental health, massive mental health crisis? And in particular, why is it the college student population struggling so much? Which to me, is it the student population or is it a generational problem? Like how is it that this generation is really struggling um, with anxiety, stress, and depression? And we talked about social media. Someone had said, um, could it be like our narcissistic kind of society, narcissistic social system? that is promoting this idea that in order for you to be long and to succeed, you have to be the best. You have to be superior. You have to stand out. You need to be as special as you can, right? There's a lot of that. And I would assume there's a lot of that in social media, right? Because your mind is looking for things that are repeated. It's looking for what is seen as positive. You're finding people who, um, who are influencers and they might be telling you what makes them so amazing. You can be amazing too. So there's this unquestioned kind of way of thinking that you can't just be yourself and be worthy of inclusion. You have to be something bigger and better um, and superior. So yeah, I'm going to be looking at that. Okay, so... Really briefly, what we transition into self-concept, our identity, how we form a sense of self. And I put quotes around self. Because for most of us, our sense of self isn't necessarily coming from our human natural tendencies. It's coming from 
societal concepts, cultural ideology, right? Your community, how your community differentiates themselves from other communities. And again, in our country, we have this idea of our community is better than your community. We're superior and we are the best, right? So again, it kind of, you look at how it's set up from the top down, upstream, right? You can see upstream concepts that probably started after World War II, more than likely, have really created an impact 100 years later. See, I'm going off, I'm going off, I need to focus. Okay, so what happens is you create a sense of self and if, that, and, and if they're coming from, let's say, cultural ideology, societal concepts, and you might, and you're not the best, and that system says you have to be superior, you're going to feel low self-esteem. You're going to feel low self-worth. That's a big issue with this idea of you're, you can feel good about yourself based on the fact that you're successful because that's contingent. Right? That means you have to be successful. And what determines that success? It's probably some cultural concept or ideal or position in a hierarchy. And if your natural state or natural ability isn't able to handle that, then you're set up to feel worthless based on you identifying by a concept of self that comes from societal structures, ideals, family ideals, which typically come from social ideals, right? So why is it then that you can go to another country and they don't suffer from this? They don't, right? It could be that they're not taught from within the home or within their social structure or within their community that they are superior and they have to prove it. They have to compare themselves with others. We're better than them. Or even in a home, you might have been compared to siblings. Who is the best, right? So this is kind of the uh, a double-edged sword, right? Because we could say having that competition promotes a lot of work, a lot of uh, innovation, right? But how is that when those people are suffering, right, internally with problems that might not, you know, help the whole. Okay. So you might feel worthless if those sense of, if your self, uh, self concept and you have quote self expectations, which are probably coming from concepts, societal structure. If you fail at those, you're going to feel worthless. And what do you think that's going to do to your central nervous system? specifically the sympathetic nervous system that says run, hide, fight, fawn, shrink, right? You're gonna probably experience what? How is it gonna show up? How, is, how does worthlessness show up biologically? Anybody know? Anxiety, right? fight or flight, heart rate. You might have the impulse to do something. You might have feelings of agitation, irritability. There's something wrong with me. I'm not going out. I don't feel good about myself. It's, I, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna feel just like I'm worthless out in public. It can create an incredible sense of anxiety that might encourage isolation, right? More and more isolation. So for example, let's just say your sense of um, attractiveness is coming from what you think, what you're seeing in social media, what you're seeing on Instagram, what you're seeing um, by people who only post when they are perfectionistic and also they alter their looks. If you're using those concepts to think that that's what you need to look like just to be seen as an equal, your natural self is going to be perceived as not good enough. And if that, if you don't have an internal sense of real authentic human worth, you're going to have anxiety. You're going to want to hide. You're going to want to go get yourself big lashes. You're going to want to like, it can, again, motivate weight training for guys who want to get bigger. It, it can motivate, but it's also directing what you do. You don't necessarily have any freedom in that space. You don't have freedom. 
you're you're being directed and you're in what feels like a personal decision isn't really personal at all. Are you guys following me right now? So for me, my decision to work out, was it really my created idea? Or was I just trying to comply to a social concept of fitness beauty? Was that mine or was I trying to fit in? Can you see my, I'm really not personally deciding what I'm doing. I'm actually choosing something out there that I think I can acquire where I have some sense of competence. So again, competence can oftentimes direct what choices you make in society and in culture and in your community. Because if you don't feel competent in this area, you're probably not going to try to compensate for feeling worthless there. But you're going to find an area where you think you can succeed and then compensate and try to fit in in that area. And for me, it was fitness. It was my body. It was easy for me. And so I don't know. I just want to be fit. It's a personal feeling. Really, it's not. You're actually accommodating to a system. Okay, I'm gonna move fast because we gotta get to the next slides. So ultimately to not comply, right? To not comply can feel like your survival is being threatened, right? Again, anxiety, uh, wanting to shrink, wanting to hide, not wanting to go out, overcompensating, um, trying to find some sense of fitting in or worth and surrendering right? We, this is where we finished last week. Surrendering is when you willfully accept, here is my authentic or innate inborn reality. And that's all I got. That's truthful. If you're willing to accept that, then you're kind of like the shackles to having to fight, flight, feed, flaunt to these cultural concepts go away but the vulnerability is if I don't comply, people who believe I should comply will judge me. Does that make sense? Anybody confused by that? Do I need to repeat it? So essentially, let me see. If I were to let go of my fitness, I'll use my body image, for example, and allow my body to naturally be what it naturally is without manipulating it, right? Without the dieting, without all the micromanaging, when I eat, how I eat, how much I eat, and not exercising in a way that's really manipulating the way my body looks. If I let all that go, when I'm free, I have so much freedom. I'm no longer a slave to those things. I don't have to obligate myself to those things, but what comes up is the real vulnerability that what if my true body is really not that awesome compared to my expectations? What if my natural state is really doesn't give me any value? Then what do I have left? Right? So I'm, I'm using body image as an example because we're going to go into that right now. But what do I have left if my body isn't what gives me a sense of value to my community? Well, then the truth, you're getting actually to the truth. So if I'm using my body to, and manipulating my body to fit a certain image, is that really truthful about who I am? Or is that a manipulation of who I am? I really need you to think about that. If I have to exercise and obsess about food and nutrition in order to be lean enough and hot enough, and muscular enough, to be perceived as fit and healthy, right? Is that really, am I telling the truth or am I lying to everybody around me about who I really am? Well, for me, it was a lie. It was like, because I didn't know what to present. So I presented a body that was awesome, but I was hollow inside. I had no sense of myself as a human being, right? So in a way I'm manipulating people around me to think that I have a sense of confidence but it's really, it's really hollow confidence. It's not confidence in me. It's confidence in a very clear and obvious body image structure that is promoted in the media, that is promoted from the diet industry. I did that, but I have no sense of self. And ultimately, I wanted to kill myself because I couldn't do it anymore, right? So that's just one example, right, of how we try to compensate in some belief system 
to make up for a, an extreme lack of sense of self. So to give up that body image felt like I was facing the Grim Reaper with nothing, right? I have no weapons. I have no armor. I have no fight, flight, flee, flaunt. I'm just sitting there with my truth and I'm going to face reality. That is hard to do. It's like putting your white flag up. And as a result, I literally sat intentionally in extreme panic and fear and did nothing about it. I'm going to pass this because... We have more to talk about. And we're actually going to go over this specific strategy in terms of healing your brain and your body from the sympathetic nervous system going crazy from beliefs that you hold, right? Because your beliefs can trigger all sorts of crazy biological reactions based on the hierarchies of need. Your beliefs say you have to meet certain standards to be worthy of love and inclusion, whether it's to God, to your family, to your community you're probably going to trigger fight or flight without them. It will feel really, really bad. And the key is what you're, what it, we want to know the truth. What's the truth of your worth as a human being? One of the things I remember thinking is that um, when I was in the middle of the depths of hell with my mental health issues was why, why do like dogs get to be dogs? Like no one is telling them that they have to be better, the most superior dogs. Cats get to be cats. Like we, we love and forgive dogs for being who they are and what they are. They don't have to worry about their coat. They don't have to change to an entirely different skin. They don't have to be a different breed. But yet humans, we can't know. You have to be the most superior version of a human being. Which who the, who the hell knows what that is? Who, who who is grandiosely narcissistic enough to say, I know what the most superior human is, right? And then to demand it without grace or lenience? Like, do we really want to follow people like that when the expectations are unex... You can't make it? There's no lenience, right? So what about, who are you? If you were a dog, right, given the grace... Given the freedom to be an animal, what are your human traits? What are your, you know, like dogs have traits. Certain breeds have traits. They have temperaments. What's natural for you? And this is why I asked the question, like the true human sense of self. There are qualities that are inherent to you as a human being. It's your birthright. You're human. You have these characteristics. The reality of it is in a community that is narcissistic, that is so not good enough. You can't, in fact, if you're just that, you're not going to make it in the real world, right? You can't just be real. You have to be some sense, you have to be a concept of what's real. And I really believe that social media, because of, again, how the brain responds to repeated imagery and repeated, 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 you've been all potentially confused about what is worthy. Well, who am I? Because you've got all this influence from different communities and systems and social structures and on online. So it's important for mental health in terms of self-concept and in terms of feeling that third hierarchy of need and checking that box, like I'm worthy of inclusion there, right? To do that, you're going to have to know the difference between community concept there's nothing wrong with community concept. It's important. I'm from Boise State. I have a role. I'm a teacher right now, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a scientist here. That's a concept of self, right? But I know the difference. Because my authentic real nature as a human, or who I am as a dog, if you want to think of that way, doesn't change. It's, it has never changed. It's never gotten better, never gotten worse. The qualities I was iner inherently born with as a human, which you all have, no one can give those to me. No one can take them from me. The fact that I naturally don't like to fight or don't want to fight unless you pick one, then I'll fight. Is no, is no one can make that better. No one can make my um, in, innate desire to have fun and play. They can't make that better, make that good. Make, they can't, no, no one can affect that. No one can take that from me. So ultimately having the ability to know the difference again from social concept um, your human innate 
humanness, and then the superficial self, right? So superficially, you're looking at my body. You're looking at my gender, maybe how I express gender, my sex. I'm a woman. I'm older. I'm like 46. I'm X generation. So there's concepts, right? So there's that. And then that's up to interpretation. Can't really control people's interpretation of my kind of superficial identity. When I put on BSU gear, I'm a BSU person, right? Okay. So uh, ideally you're empowering the truth of your innate self to be what secures your third hierarchy of need. It frees up a whole lot of stuff. Um, so let me see here. Who are you really? We're gonna go more into this, the true self. Where do you begin? Okay, so let's go into the, and the slides I'm on are last week's, last Wednesday slides, just so you know, and then in a second, I'll go into today's slides. Where do you begin? This is really interesting because, and there's lots and lots of like deep thoughts about who am I, right? And really getting, filtering out all the concepts that we've piled in growing up, concepts of I'm my parents, I'm my families, I'm my religion, I'm my politics, getting all those out, really what this comes down to is who am I? Oftentimes people confuse their sense of self with the body that they're, that they're inhabiting. I am this body. I am my ability. What, what, how is that personal in any way? How is my physical ability personal? Did I, what did I do for that? Standing here, am I, Am I doing anything? Like, how do I, how am I standing here? Am I making that happen? How much am I personally actually doing physically right now? You may want to make a guess. I'm doing nothing. I'm doing literally nothing. I, I don't know how I'm standing here. I didn't, I don't know. I don't know how my mouth is working the way it's working. I don't know how my tongue is working this way. I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't memorize this. I didn't memorize standing. I don't know how I'm hearing. I don't even know how my conscious thoughts are coming up spontaneously. Right? I don't even know how I chose to wear what I chose today. That could be primitive. I don't know. I really don't know. The problem, at least for me, was I intensely identified by my body. I thought I was my body. I thought my value was my body. And ultimately, who are you when it, if you can separate from your body? So one thing to think about, some people have described it as being a witness. So we're clearly there is a me, right, that is uniquely experiencing life. But am I really uniquely? Am I, am I really uniquely? Because I'm having a human experience. It's not unique, right? There's a lot of predictability in how I'm experiencing it. Maybe what's different is kind of the whole sum of my experiences might be different than your whole sum of experiences, even though they're probably very similar because we're ex human experiencing them from a human's perspective, right? So one way it's been described is <clears throat> you are witnessing human life because really we're not doing a whole lot of anything. Our bodies put us to sleep. Our bodies digest all of our food. Even when it comes down to cravings or what, what sounds good to eat is probably not a whole lot of choice involved there. It's a very interesting way to look at it. So think of yourself as a witness. The body provides a physical perspective that allows you to witness a human reality, a human experience. I'm bipedal, so I'm experiencing life vertical, right? Whereas a dog might experience life, they're on four legs, right? Looking at it from a different, visually from a different perspective. Again, human reality, sight dominant. 
compared to, uh, let's just use a dog again, those are, they're huge nose, sinus, their whole olfactory system is just so dominant. They can smell emotion. They can smell a ton of stuff. They can even dis, they, they, per, they theorize they can perceive time through smell. It's very interesting just how they can get a sense of reality from their whole different uh, sensory system. You are not your body. You are witnessing reality from a physical perspective that the body provides for you. Again, a human perspective that you really aren't controlling or manipulating. Sight, hearing, touch, plain, pleasure. Oops, go back. Well, actually, let's just start this. But this 35 year old is unique. No car accident, no train accident, no bus accident, no Vietnam. I was born this way. And his spine and legs failed to grow in the womb. And when he was six months old, doctors made the decision to have him. Just because he doesn't have legs, it doesn't make him different than you or me. He can do anything you can do. It's quite hard for Divorced from his first wife. In 2004, he got engaged to his fiance. People want to know if Kenny has his private parts. Yeah, I'll just show you. <laughs> we got to follow Kenny for a year of his life. 12 months of tested relationship. To be honest, I don't think that a relationship can be that much worse than it already is. And his health. I think he knows that he doesn't have the surgery that he may die. But whatever life throws at him, Kenny always fights back. Now, let me tell me to make sure you push yourself. This is a remarkable story of the man with half a body. So is he half a person? Is he half an experience? Right, he's having a whole human experience. It's just very different, right? Another person that you're going to hear me describe or use as an example is uh, Stephen Hawking. Do you guys know who Stephen Hawking is? Astrophysicist, world-renowned. He was completely physically incapable of talking, um, using he had very minimal use of his hands. I don't know exactly what disease he had. Does anybody here know? I think it was ALS in a very slow progressive form that started when he was like in, tw in his twenties. Anyway, so by the time he, um, well, he died, I think prior to COVID-19, he was, he, his purpose, his reality was pretty massive, even though he had no physical capacity, none. He had to be, you know, tube fed. Someone had to change his diapers because he had no capacity to handle his, his, his whole body function, but without his ability to function with it. I mean, he, he couldn't do anything. He had a um, computer speak for him. It was incredible. What he did with his life, really, under the circumstance, he found a purpose. He did find a meaning and purpose without a physical body. Of course, it would be a lot easier to have legs. Like, this is luxury, right? Luxury. I have no limits, right? But even so, even if you're limited, that doesn't mean you're, you still don't want to be felt, felt like you have something of value or worth, right? Psychologically, evolutionary wise, he also wanted partnership, inclusion, um, and ideally, how he perceives himself as a human being and his worth doesn't include not having legs, even though it's an obvious thing he can't get around, right? 
Um, okay, so we worked on identity resume. Okay, so I'm going to go to, you guys want to follow the next set of um, we're on class eight. Okay, so before we do anything, I'm going to set the timer for five minutes and talk with your group about what you wrote. Like, your what is your community? I want you to go over your what you guys put down in today's participation. I'll set a timer for five minutes for you guys to to go over that. If you're alone, you're going to want to get on get on the table. Let me pause this. Any of you kind of similar concepts of self, like like your community self, similar, right? Like here's what I do for a living. Here's what I want to be. This is my role in my society. Here's my religion or my political views, which really aren't yours at all. They were given to you. Um, how, was it harder to understand your kind of human self? Anybody have a hard time really coming up with that? What were some of the answers you guys came up with for your human self, your human being self? I'll start. I am goofy, really goofy. I like to goof around. Always been that way. I like to play. I'm the dog that puts their butt in the air constantly. Anybody? Want to add to that? I'm curious. Yeah, curious. You like to watch and observe, soak things in. Anybody else use curiosity? What else? What did you guys? What did you guys put in the personal human self? I just said kind of. That. I just put observing. Right. That's similar to me. Curious, like that's that witnessing part. What else? Honesty. Honesty, yeah. You feel that that's pretty something that you've always been. I'm sure your parents were like, you were always like, why is that person this way? Were you that? <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Anything else? Nothing? Okay. Some people are like drawn to music. They like all music. I would say, generally speaking, humans like to play. We love playing. The hard thing is getting to that point requires you transcend a lot of those lower, you know, survival mechanisms. And as children, you're taken care of. So it feels like you can play, right? They've observed other animals too. They don't play if their survival isn't secure. They don't, other animals don't. They play when they feel safe and secure. Humans are the same. So a lot of times, if you haven't played as a human being, you lose touch with that natural sense of self. Okay, so we're gonna get into body image throughout history. So really quick, we have a lot of slides to go through. What is body image? Who who knows the definition would like to tell the class? Anybody? Someone. I know there's someone here that knows. Anybody? I'm going to keep quiet. How we portray, we should look. How we look or how we view ourselves. Yeah, that's a great. It's not that hard, right? You did it. How we get a sense of um, worth based on the body. Body image isn't just the way you look though. This can also be concepts of the body. So for example, purity. My purity is a body image. It's a sense of worth. Again, it's connected to that third hierarchy of need around the body. A lot of people have a body image in terms of health how they relate to their body and its worth based on perceived health. So it isn't just you image, it's how you perceive the worth of your body and your mind. And it's always tied to the third hierarchy of need for the most part. When your sense of belonging is connected to a positive or negative perception about your body. So can you see how that can be 
not just how you look. It can be sexual performance. It can be my athleticism. It can be my hair. It can also be, um, again, health. Um, moving forward. So again, repetition. What is perceived valuable in your community in terms of your body is important. So repeated danger or repeated safety consistently and the consistency of what's repeated helps predict what we'll experience in any given moment. So again, what is perceived as sexually attractive, the more you see it, the more likely you're going to want to mimic that if you are seeking a sexual partner. That's just one example. Uh, if you're going into healthcare, what's perceived as healthy, you might wanna try to be that physically so that you're not seen as some, a failure. So can you see how that might be connected to that third hierarchy of need? Um, and you, you're typically looking at what's familiar in your, again, familiarity equates to safety. So if you see people shamed and shunned because of how they look, you're going to want to avoid that. That's seen as beneficial, right? So stigma, stigma in general about people's bodies is a common thing. And if you know what is stigmatized, you're more than likely going to try to avoid that thing. So Leon Festinger... 1995, he's a social psychologist studied, you know, how tribes and communities distinguish themselves with dress codes and how we are. And he really looked at what was the psychology behind it and what he found in general, because not everybody is really kind of dogmatic or strict with body image, but those people who were more lenient, were they had a more of a sense of uh, purpose within their like, themselves. And he found that people who don't have a sense that this is a normal and natural thing. If you don't have a sense of your worth internally or how you fit into your community, where your place is in your community, you're going to want to see what's repeated and you're going to want to try to blend in. So the image of your body becomes more important because you can at least look like you are part of the community. That makes sense. So again, when there's a struggle to understand and feel your worth in inclusion, you don't understand where your place is in the community, you're going to evaluate yourself in comparison. You're going to try to find what's repeated in the community. And then you're going to compare yourself to that. And then you're going to want to change, right? So when someone says, I have negative body image, chances are the comparison between their true body or where their body's at and what is seen as ideal doesn't match. And the further the distance between those two, the more significant the negativity around the body. This is, goes into every area, not just how you feel about your body, right? Again, what you do for a living, here's your reality, here's what is seen as ideal. The more distance, the worse you might feel, right? Yeah. We like to blend in, we're no different. We really aren't different. Um, the goal is that you to not stand out. You don't want to be stand out, especially if different, especially if different equates to bad or inferior. Not fitting in would feel as if you might end up being an outcast. Again, triggering fight or flight. This is where most people's anxiety currently is probably being triggered. You're either, um, so there's, there's more to it though, because some people want to stick out. Some people want to stick out. They created an identity or a sense of community sticking out. I want you guys to think about like, in your mind, what is an obvious community that doesn't want to blend in, but they want to stick out. They want to be seen as different. Anybody got want to identify? Say it again. Did you say um yes yes and there's lots of fun and vibrant attire they wear but i'm talking about their all the time not just like christmas you want to wear santa suit i mean what's the difference between people who celebrate christmas 
in Pride Month. Is there really a difference? Um, no, no, no. You're you're definitely celebrating. There's something you want to enjoy. Yeah. How about goth? Goth community that was really common growing up. That was called a. I don't know if it's still called goth. But they're not. There's no judgment when I say that, but they like to look at look the same in their difference, right? Um, so you want you don't want to stick out. You want to blend in, you, or, or you want to stick out in a positive way. So I want to be the best. I want to look the best. I want to have the best things, and I want people to know it. That's that's when there might be some narcissistic influence. Like if I blend in, how am I valuable? I need to stick out, and I need to be superior in how I stick out. Okay, we already talked about that. Okay, we already talked about that. So again, body image requires an internalized ideal. Internalization means that you agree that it is superior. Because you can be presented with a lot of different ideas, but once you agree, I agree this is superior, that's called internalization. Then it becomes your belief. Like you don't see it as a concept. You see it as a real idea, like a real belief. So for example, um, let's use uh, thin supremacy. So the idea that thinner people are superior, that means that they are symbol symbolic of healthier. We can symbolize people who are thinner as so they have more self-control. These are the typical beliefs of thin supremacy. Um, thinner people are just more attractive. Well, why would they be attractive? What's getting stimulated for thinner people to be more attractive? Hedonic area of the brain. Why would that get stimulated? Is it because there's been a repeated imagery connecting thinness to superiorness or sexuality? So is that really your opinion? No, you did not. I just really like that. Or so for example, you can use makeup, clothes. Why don't you guys like skinny jeans anymore? Is that your opinion? Is it your opinion that skinny jeans aren't cool anymore? Or are you just being conditioned by what's repeated as positive? Right, so know what that is. It's not really, I don't know. I just like bell bottoms right now. Chances are you've seen it in social media in a positive way enough times that you're actually attracted to that type of gene. And who's promoting the, these body images? Probably someone selling the clothing, right? And then they pay other people to sell it and promote it. So the more you see it, the more. So typically these are based on um, symbols of inclusion. They usually are based on looks because humans are highly dominant visual animals. It can also be functions like ability, disability, sex, sexuality, concepts of disease. So we can see here, this would be kind of spiritual dress codes. And there's probably so much more we could have added to this, like how people signify or signal their beliefs through codes of dress. Here we are. We've got how we conform, right, in some different way how we can show people our beliefs through physical dress. Again, I'm not here nor there. It's just how do we differentiate our uh, uh, beliefs if we don't, if we can't talk, how can we show it? You put flags on your truck. You can put a sticker of inclusion on your car. There's ways that we can show how we identify religiously or culturally by visual um, <laughs> signs. This is the goth. It's an aesthetic. Other countries do it too. Would you guys agree this is sticking out in a different way? Like how to stick out differently? It might be fun. I mean, I'm not judging. This is, this could be really fun. Like play, here we are, fitness. So how many of you have seen 
you know, I played volleyball and we used to pull our socks up. Does anybody here play volleyball? We pull our socks up, at least I used to, because we could wipe our feet on it. And then we would weight train with our socks up because they were sweaty and you didn't want them bunched down. Now it's cool. I'd like to think maybe we started that fun. Tights, different types of shoes, again, dress codes. So let's get into history. A lot of times these body images are made to differentiate the rich and wealthy from the poor. They started elongating skulls when babies were babies because they wanted to signify that they had more money, more class, more, doesn't have to be money. Back then it can be, I am wealthier, I am more powerful than you. So the elongated skulls were a way to stick out as wealthy, right? People do that with their cars, they do it with their shoes, they do it with their Face injections, that's a really big body image thing right now is how much injections can you get? Can you magnify your lips to be twice or three times larger than what's normal? Brazilian butt lifts. How many people can afford this stuff? Well, thousands, we're talking thousands of dollars of upkeep, cheek implants, cap implants, on and on and on and on. Again, the dress codes changed to signify I'm rich and powerful. I am above you in the hierarchy of who gets to be thrown out. So you can see um, the Egyptians used to do hair, their hair signified their class because of uh, lice. I mean, there was a lot of pestilence, so they would shave their heads and use different wigs and different styles of wigs would tell people where you were in the hierarchy of value. And so people who couldn't afford wigs or couldn't, they were, you know, avoid these people. So you can see the working class had very similar types of head shaving. And then the rich had similar wigs to signify where they were in the hierarchy. And it has changed throughout history. It used to be purity um, because sex was seen as the devil, right? Sexual purity. So the women would pluck their eyelashes because they were too sexy. My God, she grew her eyelashes out. That's why I raised her, right? Because she deserved it. And same with foreheads. Foreheads were seen as like intelligent. Like I am just so much better than you because of a higher forehead. This is happening today. A lot of you don't maybe not see it. You might be like, yeah, I want a Brazilian butt lift and you don't know why. You're like, why do I want lip, lip injections? Why am I overlining my lips? Well, it's because you're, that's a sign, that signals that you're superior. You're richer. What? <laughs> <laughs> Not, I, you know, you be you. <laughs> but know what you're doing and why you're doing it. It takes the seriousness out of it. If you don't know why you're doing this, you're going to feel bad about your natural self. You're gonna feel bad. It's, if this woman knows what she's doing, whatever, who cares, have fun. Have fun with your aesthetic. There's nothing wrong with this. The problem is when people don't know why they're doing it and they don't know why they feel bad about themselves, why she won't go out in public with her outer fake lashes, that's gonna affect her mental health, right? The unibrow is coming back. That used to also be a sign of beauty. Elongated necks, the longer a woman's neck, the more, again, rich. It also was a sign that she had intelligence, work ethic, that she could prove herself, that she was determined. So you can imagine a woman who didn't have this was seen as lazy, incompetent, lower class. It's all symbol symbolic of that narcissistic system that might impact, and this is, if they take those out, they can't hold their head up because the bones are stretched out, right? And the discs change and the muscles stop working. It's very painful to take that out. Um, same thing with, again, the adornments, how to signify that you are superior to others. Again, this is that narcissistic idea. This is, I think, Queen Elizabeth. 
the one, I don't know. Um, this is in Japan, women would paint their teeth black to signify their, their marriage. They're married, I'm pretty sure. Anybody know more about this than me? Because that's all I know about it. No, that was a sign that I am taken. Um, wigs were came about again. Men used to wear wigs. And they also signified your wealth, your jobs, how you could visibly distinguish someone's worth in the community, how you wore your wig, what that represented to your class. So I want you to pay attention to the nails here. This was a sign of I'm wealthy. And so it somehow over the years, um, again, these change and they, they evolve rapidly too. The, the length of the nails were the, a sign that you, you didn't do labor. That's what that means. I don't do labor. That's not my type of job. So <laughs> that's what the long nails meant. I think this is in China. That I am superior to that. Foot binding. So this is also in China. So this was for a thousand years, over a thousand years. I want you to think of how many generations passed this down, specifically to women in particular, because the, they didn't do this with men. Um, the smallness of your feet was a symbol that you were more intelligent, you knew more, you worked harder, that you were had self-control, and they started binding feet when they were little, little, little. You basically be became, um, you couldn't do much. So it's also another sign of wealth because you didn't have to work. You could spend more time bandaging up your feet and you had maids and people to take care of you. So the ideal length of foot was between three and five inches. If your foot was larger than five inches, as a woman, you were seen as ugly, not sexually attractive. This was a sign of sexual attractiveness. And keep in mind, men believed it too. It wasn't just women holding women to this. It was a thousand years of men looking at what size are your feet, how the brain can change based on what is repeated. So none of you are immune to thinking that Brazilian butt lifts are hot. Way out here, that big lips are hot. You're not immune to being affected by what is perceived as sexually attractive either direction, right? So for this to perpetuate, it took men saying, I agree, those tiny feet are sexy, let's go. It's on, DTF? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> A thousand years that women were defined by the size of their feet, your worth in your community. How many women do you think had an obsessive compulsive foot binding disorder that we would diagnose them with today? They wouldn't question the belief. They just say, why is she obsessed about the wrapping? She must have some OCD about wraps, right? No one looks at the societal belief system as the problem for why women might have problems, right? Pass down, generation after generation. So we can look at men in hair, the importance of hair and facial hair and how it changed over time. To have meaning, whether it represents I'm, I'm uh, rough and I live in the wilderness or I'm um, particularly smart, just the meaning of how it all works. And the media, where you must have a mustache, right? What it means to be upscale and how do we identify our worth in society by its visual marks of wealth and higher class, class system. So for a very long time, we're talking centuries, hundreds and hundreds of years, people who were large were seen as wealthy 
This is still occurring in countries where there's a lot of starvation. If you have more body fat, you are seen as amazing. It's a symbol of wealth, access to food. You must be smart. You must be successful. You have access to food. So this was seen as gorgeous and beautiful. And men who looked like this had all the women. Because why? if you're living in poverty, why wouldn't you want that? This is a sign. This is a symbol of someone who will take care of you, right? Who will provide me my first and second hierarchies of me. So visual sense of uh, safety in a community. And then it changed. It flipped like this. In the early 1800s, it went from... People with largeness were seen as the most wealthy. They had access to the best health care. They had access to all you can imagine, best food. And then what happened is medicine changed. So everybody got access to medicine. Everybody got access to more food. And as the haves or the high class could not visibly separate themselves from the lower class, it shifted. Oh, we don't like being fat anymore. We don't like it. Nasty. This started around the late 1800s and really intensified um, in the 1920s. So don't be fat. No one's going to love you, but you can reduce it with soap. What? Oh, yeah. Just buy this soap. It'll wash off your lard. The authority, if you, if you read this, I'm not kidding. Um, a lot of times it'll say, my doctor told me to use the soap. So they'll try to use an authority figure to then validate that you should do this and look how much, look at the face. Like, oh, I'm such a terrible person. Now I look amazing. Body image, right? So it's changing. And then I went to corset. So how do we look thinner and voluptuous? This is cool again, right? So again, I want you to be aware of how much of this is in the media? How much of this you're seeing? And then it's there too. We're going to get there. There's that corset again. Oh, look who's selling it. Big lips, eyebrows, eye face, boobs, all the things. Banish your fat. Tapeworms, you guys. Let's take some tapeworms. Oh, the authority is telling you that this is what you should do. And you're also being told what is making you worthy of rejection, abandonment, disapproval, right? So we're talking third hierarchy of need, and then the resolution is tapeworms. Mm -hmm. Easy to swallow, you guys. And you don't have to exercise. No, no exercise. No ill effects at all. This is still happening. Just you know, we're gonna we're about to get there. It's just not with tapeworms. <laughs> Live tapeworm eggs. Yes. <laughs> three, three pounds, three to five pounds a week. So this is also still happening. The problem is there's an authority figure. And what, what happens if, if the authority says this is what happens and it's easy and people believe it, then what happens if you do the same thing and you only lose a half a pound a week? Who's at fault with there? If the authority in your media says, oh my God, three to five pounds a week and you only lose a half a pound, who is at fault? You are, right. No one thinks that this is a bunch of shit. No one knows. So again, the belief system would then be, if you don't meet the body image, like the binding of the feet, you must be lazy and dumb. Men, if you don't have muscles, you must be lazy. You must not give a shit, right? There's body images all over. If you don't have enough hair on your head, what's wrong with you? So the illusion with most body image is, again, the third hierarchy of need based in nar narcissistic belief systems that your worth is worthless unless you are ideal. Okay, we'll see you guys on Wednesday. We'll continue with this. <laughs> Like, yeah, it's the